I work in many different projects related to financial reform and alternative finance. Um, and if you really want to check out my stuff, just tap in Brett Scott Finance and you can find my blog and stuff and all my things that I do. Um, but most recently, I, well, the reason I asked me to come here was I, I did a paper for the United Nations Research Institute on Social Development on blockchain technology. Um, and the extent to which it might be socially empowering. <coughs> Are any of you involved in blockchain stuff? Okay. And I don't really know how I got the job writing it for them. I just, I get these weird sort of gigs of people because I spend lots of time with different communities. Um, and the actual group in the UN is um, working on a project around social and solidarity finance. And to really understand that, you could understand there's a whole history of um, different international development practitioners who work on finance um, and there's a lot of critique internal to that community so a lot of people are aware of microfinance for example but microfinance is a very particular paradigm that came out in the 1980s um, and it was very much about how do we take existing market systems and push them into communities um, that's a bit of a crude description of microfinance but that's effectively what that's why it's so popular among mainstream development organizations, was it's a very palatable message. Um, and the basic analysis that happens in this, this community is, the reason why people are poor is that the markets don't work properly for them, and therefore the prescription that we should then put in is, find ways to make them better at competing within markets. All right. So that's, that's the main paradigm within much of what's called financial inclusion. Um, it's behind lots of the language that you find, for example, the concept of, of the unbanked comes from this concept. All right. um, so, I'm not necessarily critiquing it, but um, it is a dominant paradigm, and the, within this group in the UN, they've got an alternative paradigm, which is saying, rather than starting from the concept of the market's going to come to everything, why don't we start with actual communities, and then think about how you build financial systems internal to those communities that are not necessarily about bringing external banks into them. Is that kind of clear? Okay. Yeah. Now you don't have to take that critique on it. That's basically, they're trying to provide a counterbalance to the traditional narrative. Um, so that's why I wrote that paper for them as part of a broader project. Um, if you want to read the paper, it's 10,000 words long. So I can't actually go through all of it right now, especially with this voice. So if you want to get all the nuances of it, you really have to kind of to see it, uh, but it was picked up by, by Motherboard, Advice, and Coindesk, and they wrote these really kind of like sensationalized versions of it, which were, as, the, as you expect from media organizations, which are basically saying Bitcoin's too libertarian to save the developing world, or something like this, which is kind of a bullshit kind of idea that you can save the developing world. Um, but this is what they wrote. I got a lot of flack from it from, it, from a bunch of people. Um, so if you want to read it, don't read the, the news articles about it. Go read the actual paper. Um, the, um, <coughs> the basic stuff it goes through is the traditional narratives in the Bitcoin community about how Bitcoin might be um, empowering. And then it goes into the blockchain scene. And you probably have noticed over the last, like, literally two weeks, the, the narrative about blockchain has suddenly hit the, the mainstream. Um, and now everybody who thinks that they, uh, in every mainstream organization is now feeling the need to have to say something about it. Which is interesting, because the original blockchain community was very, um, has a very anarchic feel, and now suddenly the hegemonic force, um, and when I use the word term hegemony, I don't just mean some kind of like, I mean it in the original sense, where um, powerful cultural institutions sort of shift the narrative very subtly to make it seem very normal. Um, and so everyone's suddenly like feeling it's very normal to go and become consultants for IBM about blockchain. And that's stuff always what we always wanted to do, right? And it's like, of course, and you, if, you, if you do it like incrementally and slowly enough, it seems very normal. Um, but what's actually happening, of course, is that there's an appropriation going on. Maybe it's a good thing, I don't know. Um, but um, anyway, that's going on. So the, the second part's about the blockchain tech. Um, with the, if you were in the, the Bitcoin community, you would probably would have, there's a bunch of traditional narratives about why it's empowering. One of them is to do with remittances. There's a lot of problems with this remittances argument. It's possibly, it possibly might be useful. It's certainly not proven to be useful though. Um, it could be useful in the, in the remittances field. Um, and then there's a, a sort of a secondary argument about this unbanked concept, which is Bitcoin could come to form some kind of like quasi-bank account. Um, 
the thing is that within financial inclusion stuff, having a bank account is really a pretty small part of financial inclusion stuff. Like, the real, I'm not saying this is not important, but the real issue with much of international development is around access to credit. You know, merely placing a payment system doesn't really do anything. Like, you have to have credit systems that actually enable people to have investment and so on. So, this is not to sort of slate the Bitcoin community, but maybe just to say, look, this is cool that we've developed an alternative payment system, great. But this doesn't really resolve the whole problem of um, credit systems. And often there's quite a naive narrative that goes in, around in, in Bitcoin, which is like, we can replace the banks. And it's like, as if all the banks there were payments. It's like, the banks dominate the payments industry because they dominate the credit issuance in society. That's why banks dominate payments, is that they dominate the issuance of money itself. Like, so you cannot disintermediate banks from payments. It doesn't, it doesn't exist, this concept. Um, so unless you have credit systems, you, you're not really competing with the banks. All right. So that was just a sort of a, a point I was trying to try to bit in the paper. Again, it's not necessarily like a, like a damning critique, but it's more just saying, um, what's just going on? <coughs> there was also a sort of a um, <coughs> political critique which is this idea that really, if you engage in proper international development, you start with people. You don't start with technology. And again, technology is amazing, but a lot of the, the sort of story that you come out, comes out a lot of tech communities, um, and this is to be something you're going to have to navigate with this, this new venture, is the idea that we have tech. Let's find things we can do with it somehow. And it's always a fine line between what is essentially... Because who basically develops tech? Let's face it, it's people like people in this room. All right. Now, not to be dismissive, but I suspect the people in this room are not, I wouldn't say, are representative of deep social problems in developing countries. Um, so there has to be a sort of a certain reality check. Being uh, A lot of people who come from the scene go into that with a quite a patronizing mindset. And within international development, this is well known. You know, so it's, I'm not saying you're not aware of this, but you find a lot of the stories that come out are actually quite patronizing. And often in, in, the, in the Western imagination, there's this concept of the African person. It's like the person in Africa, or like the African village. Um, I'm actually from South Africa, um, and I spend much time in Mozambique and Zimbabwe and many places, and, and there is no such person as this imagined figure. Like, it, like people live their lives in different ways, with different conditions, with different technologies. They don't exist in some kind of strange, abstract, half-person state, which is often what's imagined from the context of London. They're like this person who's not quite complete. They're lacking something. They're defined by their lack of something, not by the presence of something. And this is a really big me problematic mental construct. Um, of course, if you actually spend time with the people in these countries, you realize they just as, you know, have just as much ability and so on. Um, so that's why I would just encourage anybody who's in this community to sort of thinking more about how do you really do that with, with some kind of empathy for people you're working with. Um, the um, other sort of part of that narrative is the idea of the predatory government. So there's always like the poor African person and then the predatory government that sort of like fucks them all the time, some way. Like really screws them over. And then we can save this poor person by combating their government. Um, if you do any kind of like political philosophy, you realize that, or actually political science, like governments are not separated from the constituencies that they form part of. There's a reason why the Swedish government is so advanced, as well as the population being incredibly educated at the same time. Because these things co-evolve and cycles together. Um, and there's a reason why in a country that has huge amounts of um, lack of education, really crap colonial histories, that you get really crap governance structures. You can't just go and hit the governance structure and expect things to be better. You have to work with everything at the same time. And then you look, proper development practitioner understands this. Um, so within the libertarian community, there's this really problematic idea that all you've got to do is somehow combat the government, and then all the people will be empowered. And it's like, the reason why the government screwed up is because the underlying sort of conditions in the society don't allow it to be, to be um, a proper government. So anyway, that's just another sort of kind of critique I'd say. Um, on the blockchain 2.0 stuff, there is a lot of cool stuff you can do. Um, those critiques aside, you know, so what I am interested in going forward is could you use blockchain 2.0 um, 
or for example, designing uh, decentralized insurance systems in places where it's actually hard to get insurance. So for example, small scale farming insurance, um, for example, even mutual credit systems, which are a way for people to actually issue credit to each other. Mutual credit systems are very interesting, I think, in the context of developing countries. Um, and so there's various potential applications, even into the realm of things like decentralized cooperatives of various sorts, um, arranged through blockchain technology. Um, maybe I'll stop there for now and take some questions, or unless how you want me to elaborate more on my paper. I'm not sure. What do you feel? <laughs> cool, cool. Can we ask the questions? I'm, I'm kind of struggling to talk questions? anyway. Yeah, just love to uh, understand a little bit more about how you see uh, blockchain being used within fintech. Within fintech? In what part of fintech? Um, say supporting social entrepreneurs, for example. Because we're looking at this at the moment with our uh, funding platform. So it's an area we're really interested in. So yeah. I don't know. Love... What do you, you tell, tell me? I, I don't know. Okay, so we're um, a crowdfunding and commercial. I'm actually going to be speaking after you. Oh, cool. So yeah, so we, we I'm trying to get my head round cryptocurrency and trying to understand how it could actually be deployed uh, for social entrepreneurs, for social projects. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, it seems like there's a split between people saying that it's going to go down in flames, it's never going to go anywhere in the same way they said about crowdfunding, and then split between people saying, no, blockchain is going to be the future, it's going to help the unbanked, it's going to help open up uh, social investment opportunities, and yeah, revolutionize funding. So yeah, just love to know, you seem like an authority on this, man, so I'm going to ask the question. No, 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 no. Um, <coughs> I mean, I have no idea. I mean, it's it's like any technology. There's many different potentials within it. It really depends on the sort of context that it's used in, right? I mean, I guess the useful way to talk about blockchain technology is, is distributed database technology or decentralized database technology. Um, that has many potential applications. I mean, in the context, I don't think I understand your context well enough. Um, but the sort of the basic idea of in what context is de decentralized distributed database technology useful? There's a political element to it. If you're trying to diminish the power of centralized intermediaries, that was one of the initial impulses of why such a technology might be useful, because it enables you to bypass centralized intermediaries. There's an efficiency component, which a lot of the banks are looking at. It's like, well, perhaps this database style would be more efficient. We can save money like this. They don't really care. Banks have absolutely no interest in bypassing authority systems. It's, they are authority systems, right? So it's more about efficiency. Um, and there's, the, there's a sort of another element which is in, with concept of international development, some of that becomes about, well, if you've got really poor in, institutional infrastructure, for example, really like you, you're really lacking infrastructure, maybe well, these systems actually might be very fast to deploy. So in sort of refugee situations and so on. Again, I'm not answering your question in particular, but uh, decentralized database technology might be useful um, in a situation where there's not much other infrastructure around. Um, I wouldn't fetishize it though. I mean, to be honest, centralized stuff often just is more efficient and works better. Um, so I guess if you're going to go into any kind of um, project looking at uh, blockchain, don't go and thinking that it's somehow some kind of going to solve some issue. I mean, it might just be more of a hassle. And I think one of the most interesting things going forward will be how people can combine decentralized systems with centralized systems to create hybrids. Because already with Bitcoin right now, I'm going a bit of a tangent, but there's some serious governance problems that come with decentralized technology. The problem with decentralized technology systems is that they do not have decentralized governance systems. So you throw out decentralized technology into society with no governance systems around it. By governance, I mean ways for people to have any kind of say in it or impact. And in the open source community, governance is, is uh, perceived as, if you don't like it, just don't use it, right? It's like, and it's like, well, that's a bit of an uh, unsatisfactory answer. And I like open source culture, don't get me wrong. But you can see it was a Bitcoin. They, they put it out, they put the code out, and then it was the, uh, the idea was, like, if you don't like it, fork the code. And lots of people are trying to fork the code, it never works, especially with network goods. Network goods, you, don't, you can't compete against them because they only work the more people get involved in them, right? So even though Bitcoin is actually technically probably inferior to many of the, to the other cryptocurrencies, it's still much more powerful, because it's not in anybody's interest to leave it. So if you really want to have political systems, with, with, with governance systems, you're really going to find ways of countering that kind of that sort of system. Um, and right now with Bitcoin, you'll, you, if you've been following the sort of controversies, um, it essentially it's become a kind of developer autocracy, 
where the, the core developers have just taken it over and make decisions. Um, because there's, there's no governance system built into it. So I'm going to say, if you're going to build these systems, make sure you've got interesting decentralized governance systems as well. That's a bit kind of vague. Yeah, yeah um, I just wanted to pick up on the efficiency point. Is the fact that, you know, as far as I understand it, all blockchain technology needs a heck of a lot of computing power behind it. Is that an issue? Not necessarily, no. Okay. Only the, only the, 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 the purely like open anarchic ones. But if you're running one internal, let's say we implemented one in this room, we did, would not necessarily know. Okay. If you, it's, it's the difference that I make is between the sort of the public blockchain systems, which are the ones that anybody can join, like Bitcoin, and then what they call the private or permission blockchains, um, which is you know only a certain part that people are allowed to join the decentralized network. And that's what the banks are working on. Would be you know for example to look at the Hyperledger project and. Um, the what's it called um, R three Dev or whatever it is, some, some as a consortium of banks they're all working on private blockchain systems. Right. right. <laughs> Sorry, I was just wondering what you thought of MadeSafe. I know it's a bit of data. I don't actually know. I, I remember I met, I met the guy like a couple of years ago. That was like it's a way to do dis distributed file storage, right? Yeah, I mean it's similar back end blockchain, but it just they also have a sort of social element with the alternative currency system. And yeah, so they're trying to incentivize it with Safecoin or something. Yeah. Do you want to explain it? Uh, <laughs> Okay, no, I'm not involved. It's just a wondering. You seem to be one of the people that probably know about it, and I was just wondering because of the social aspect, what you thought. Of yeah, that, Damien, do you know? <laughs> okay. Yeah, a bit, but uh, I oh, think I think all those like, uh, all uh, all those projects are, are are all interesting, and I think what we're going to see is that under the term blockchain, there is so many concepts. <coughs> the modularity of all those pieces of research are going to be interesting to follow in the next few years because each piece of research is making progress and you organize them the way it works for fulfilling your objective. So the main, main, main point is what you're trying to achieve is important and depending on what you're trying to achieve you're going to be able to use. If, and if you guys are, you should guys just chat to Damien if you, and also Chris as well. If you, if you, if you want to, those two dudes at the back, I know tons of stuff about the technicalities of the blockchain and so on. <coughs> So, anything you want, to, you want to add? Yeah, I do want to ask a question, because I've read the paper quite a few times. You draw this axis between the uh, libertarian conservatives and the socialist libertarians, and I wanted to put to you, well, I wanted to ask you first why that axis, why you picked on a few people, players in the industry, like Suzanne Templeton and, um, and Roger Burr. And, and I would say, if I'm going to be critical, because I think your critique of those two is spot on, don't get me wrong. That was not I wonder why you picked on the two most polarizing characters in the industry instead of looking at the nuance. Because is there not a different axis we can look at? We can read a Marxist interpretation of what's happening on two cultures. Marx had the concept of alienation. He used the word alienation several times in the paper, in the lowercase a. You don't actually reference his concept. And as somebody that used to work in the well, I still do work in information security, I just don't get paid for it anymore. But back when I used to get paid for it, there was a clear demarcation between the managerial class and the IT department. And we were often asked to do things as engineers by the managerial class that went against our instincts as engineers. So we were basically being asked to break the code. All of the code that is in Bitcoin was at Stanford, circa 2000. Right? All, of, all of the technology, like the Merkle trees and the proof of work, and all of its core components, from peer to peer, the secret, the node discovery on the networks and that stuff, right? it all existed in the year 2000. And it took us nine years to open source it and bring it to everybody. So isn't there a Marxist interpretation? I was wondering why you picked this axis of like, you know, conservative libertarian, socialist libertarian, sure. not a bunch of more nuanced. <laughs> um, well, Marxist concept of alienation is around the fact that you are unaware of the relations of production and you know, or what you... you, you, you You've got this commodity fetish. Yeah. You think everything's well, about. I know the means of my production, right? It's right here in front of me. Yeah. Okay. You see my point? Is that you could have, you could have drawn that distinction. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me go. Let me go back to the um, conservative libertarianism versus social libertarianism. <laughs> Who is like really interested in like political philosophy? Is it a thing? <laughs> Interest <laughs> Interestingly, within the within the tech community, there's a lots of pseudo libertarians. Because it's a kind of like a loosely convenient ideology, even though people don't really, much like in much activist community, this sort of like pseudo Marxist stuff and stuff. So it's like, it's kind of like a loosely coherent, useful way to think about yourself while you're engaging in entrepreneurial activity. Um, 
so yeah, it's quite interesting as a social point anyway. Um, my point in that paper was that both conservative libertarianism and socialist, social anarchism, or whatever you want to call it, libertarian socialism, seek to remove hierarchy and seek to move away from centralization. But there's different reasons for them doing that. Um, within Marxian stuff, that's not necessarily the case. Okay, so just that's maybe why I didn't focus on it, and most of the community probably wouldn't have. Um, but just for the basic point, and let's go into I'll talk, I'll talk about the trust point. In the original Bitcoin community and a lot of the blockchain community, a lot of the, a lot of the critique was around trusted intermediaries. So the idea that in most of our current society, when I walk into the shop to buy cough medicine, um, I don't know the shopkeeper, but somehow there's a, there's a whole sort of institutional trust system set up, a set of, system, system of laws and contracts and so on, that enable me to interact with this complete stranger without knowing them, feeling relatively secure that I'm not going to be screwed, and if I am screwed, there'll be some recourse. And most of markets are facilitated by this process. Markets don't really exist without this institutional trust infrastructure that underpins them. Um, within libertarian communities, this is definitely understood, um, but, but the big critique is that the institutions that are set up to create this trust infrastructure are run by human beings. All right. And Within libertarian ideology, there's the idea that human beings are fundamentally self-interested. And if you have fundamentally self-interested people running the infrastructure that keeps markets going, they distort markets, aka the government, the corrupt politicians, and so on, right? The Federal Reserve. Um, and this has always been the reason why libertarian groups call for minimal government that just protects property rights and maintains police services. And that's the basic concept. And then when a blockchain came around, there was a sort of this imagination that you could actually have discovered another entity which is non-human that enables you to do the same thing without having the humans there. All right, so you could create this techno leviathan that enables you to interact with people without having to actually trust centralized intermediaries. Within the anarchist community, the, the um, critique around centralized structures is different. Anarchists believe that humans are not fundamentally self-interested. They believe humans are fundamentally social beings that actually have, are fundamentally tied together, but the problem is in, in highly centralized systems they become alienated from each other and get corrupted by these power systems. All right, so that the reason that's why you want to go back and start to try, try to re-engineer social, social relations. Um, so there's a new <coughs> anarchist conception of blockchain technology emerging. Sorry, this is a little bit like obscure for, but, but this is, uh, if you want to read into my conceptions, read the paper, but I totally take your point. And, and bear in mind, I wrote that paper like, in like seven days or something like really fast, so I didn't, I couldn't go into all the nuances of the entire world. Yeah, you also pointed Hobbes as well. You're all against all, Hobbes also said the laws of nature from authority, not from truth. As an engineer, I can tell you, if my laws are governed by truth, my code doesn't compile them up until two in the morning, and I'm fixing it. And that's why I, I was urging you to draw an axis that was uh, orthogonal to the one. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll work on a new paper together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If anybody wants to get a hold of me, um, just go into my blog, you just type in Brett Scott, so you'll find my blog, and then you can, my email address is on there. I'm going to have to go quite soon, because I'm quite sick. Um, so you might look at this, but if anybody wants to ask me anything, feel free. Thanks, Brett. Okay, nice one. Um, Brett tweets on Sue Possum. And I put a link on, uh, your I hope it's okay, Brett, I put a link on the paper, onto uh, the Meetup group, so if you, uh, if you want to download and read it. Um, but uh, get home safe, man. Thank you again.